for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who died in the last week, particularly Francis J. Kupchunas, loving wife and mother of our friend Carl, Patricia A. Mulcahy Kingsley, devoted wife, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, sister, aunt, and former Scranton Police Department Detective Bureau employee. James Bambi Coyle, beloved son, brother, uncle, great uncle, and a 20-year St. Patrick's Day Parade coordinator, and their dear families and friends who suffer their loss. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Mr. Loscombe? Here. Mr. Joyce? Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third Order 3A, Minutes of the Firemen's Pension Commission meeting held August 28, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, Minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held August 28, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, minutes of the Scranton Police Pension Commission meeting held August 28, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, minutes of the Scranton Lackawanna Health and Welfare Authority's regular meeting held August 15, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, Single Tax Office City Funds Distributed Comparison for the years 2012 through, two, through 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Agenda for the Zoning Hearing Board meeting to be held October 9th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3G, audit statement of the Scranton Sewer Authority for the year ending March 31st, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3H, audit status reports received from Robert Rossi and Company dated September 18th and September 26th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3I, Tax Assessor's Report for Hearing and Appeal Results dated September 11th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3J, Tax Assessor's Report for Hearings held on September 18th, 25th, and October 2nd, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, <coughs> received and filed. 3K, Tax Assessor's Reports for Hearings to be Held on October 9th, 16th, 17th, 23rd, 24th, and 30th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes tonight, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? And before you begin, uh, please let the uh, record stage that Councilman Joyce and Councilman Rogan are in attendance at tonight's meeting. I just have one if I can. Sure. Uh, first of all, I would like to announce that Troop 57 from Holy Rosary Boy Scouts are here this evening uh, working on their citizenship badge. And uh, I think it's, it's great. And whoever advised you picked a good meeting because there's not a lot on the agenda tonight. So. <laughs> but. Uh, if you would just stand quickly so we can applaud you for your work. Keep up 
the good work. And if you have any questions for us, uh, feel free to ask later. Thank you. And an acknowledgement to the gentlemen who are accompanying these fine young men, I believe the scout leaders. So they are certainly, uh, I think, deserving of a round of applause, too, for all the voluntary work they do. Definitely. Is there anyone else? Uh, just one very quickly, a personal one. Uh, I'd just like to wish my Uncle Joe um, well and hope that he's watching next week from at home and not where he's at tonight. Thank you. I also have one. Uh, the West Grants and Hyde Park Neighborhood Watch is having a spaghetti dinner fundraiser October 6th from noon till 6 p.m. at the Villa Maria 2. Um, there's eat-in meals, takeout meals, and delivery to senior living locations with pre-ordered meals. The cost is $10, which includes pasta, meatballs, salad, and bread. And there will also be basket raffles at the fundraiser. Elm Park Church, located at the corner of Jefferson Avenue and Linden Street in Scranton, will present the program An Early History of Our Church and Community on Monday, October 7, 2013 at 6.30 p.m. Speakers include Gina Aleo, <coughs> historical interpreter, who will provide an overview and insights, Tom Costello, who will offer an illustrated presentation of American artist P.W. Costello, whose work is displayed in the church, and Sandy Connell, who will present personal family accounts of William Connell, former president of the Board of Trustees and U.S. Congressman. The public is invited to attend. And that's it. Fourth order, citizens participation. Our first speaker tonight is Ron Elman. It's very unpleasant living with pain all the time. Is that not true, Miss Janet? Yes, yes. Yes. Don't put that there. <laughs> you know, over the years, the same as most of you, I, I, I've probably talked to a thousand people about the problems of Scranton. And one thing I picked up on recently, they just don't seem to care about all the consequences of lawsuits and pensions and all. They're worried about the future, about a four, five, six hundred dollar increase in taxes. I think the, the Obama administration says that the, the mean for the country is something like $52,400, something like that. Is that right, Frank? Um, I, I don't know the exact yeah. figure, but the uh, median household income you know uh, how many on people, average. You, how many doors you would have to knock on in this city to find somebody making a thousand dollars a week? You know, half the city is retired and low income. You know, I, I commend council for resisting this 117 percent increase or whatever it is, but there there doesn't seem to be no alternatives. And people, they just fear this happening. And, you know, I, all I get is my Social Security, which is less than $1,000 a month. And I, I've lived for six, seven years on my savings and, and the equity in my house. And, and, you know, I can get by better than, than most of the people I talk to. For, for God's sake, they just don't have it anymore. These people have given up. You know, they just keep giving and giving. It's got to stop somewhere. It's, Mr. Miller brought the first intelligent proposal of something to do, and council hasn't commented on it. It worked for Pittsburgh. It you know, it made the universities and the nonprofits their cave in. You know, look where we are. Lackawanna College advertises on billboards and radio and television. They've taken the heart of our city, and they, tell, they told the people of this city to go to hell. They're not paying for nothing. Of course, 
the University of Scranton, that's another story. They, 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 I, I saw the paper 25 years ago, they tried to get money from, from them. You know, it's just, they are just a greedy, unscrupulous bunch of parasites. But I, I've told you before, the university's Achilles heel is bad publicity. And I've heard this from the, the horse's mouth, so to speak. They don't want the world to know how corrupt and evil and vile they are to the people of this city. But one thing they don't want is, is the adversity of, of, of bad publicity when they're trying to have students come to this city. And that's where you need to attack them. You know, I might sound like a radical, but what we need is a, is a march upon this building. We need to have a march of all the taxpayers against City Hall to get the attention of this administration and get the attention of all these phony nonprofits around here. There's thousands of people out there that should, should do something for crying out loud. They could certainly come down here and block traffic and, 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 and show the world what we're going through. We're just getting nowhere except raising taxes and raising taxes. You know, like I, I always tell you, I talked to six, eight people. I talked to a, a man today on the phone. They took away his food stamps. To, they gave him $2 a month, he told me. I don't know how much his food stamps were. But he, he, he said, $2 a month. Last week when I left here, I went over to Price Right, and there's, there's a guy with three big basketfuls of, of soda in those long, I don't know what you call them, the long cartons. He had three basketfuls. And I happen to know who he is. He sells them at the South Side Complex when they play soccer. He's buying it with food stamps. And here's a poor guy that, that has a house that was talking to me about taxes. They give him $2 a month. It, these are the kind of people that, that need our help somehow. And I think a march against City Hall and to let everybody know what the hell is going on in this city because it's not going no place. It's just staying right here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Elman. Thank you. Bill Jackowitz. Good evening, Scranton City Council. Bill Jackwood, South Scranton resident. Good evening. Good evening. Member of the taxpayers. 7,937 days ago, Scranton was declared a distressed city under Act 47. Scranton has had two mayors, Mayor Connors and Mayor Doherty, soon to have the third mayor who will be elected in November. Several city council presidents, Polshus, Hazuri, Murphy, DeBilio, Gatelli, McGough, and Evans. What has changed in the past 7,937 days? Taxes have been raised numerous times. The 500 block Lackawan Avenue has been renovated at the cost of approximately 30 million taxpayer dollars. Although, although never completed or occupied by any taxpaying business, currently we have a burnt out building anchoring one end of the block, a vacant building, Molly Brannigan's, anchoring another end of the block, who by the way, owe the city a few hundred thousand dollars. Millions of taxpayers' dollars have been given to the goodwill to renovate the North Scranton Junior High School building. Has the project ever been started? Never mind, has, never mind being completed. The Steamtown Mall Association continues to owe the Scranton taxpayers while the mall continues to be a burden on the city. Four times higher vacancy rate than the average mall in the, in the United States. Provides minimum wage part-time jobs. The Ark Park has been renovated at the cost of million of millions of dollars. A bridge that leads to nowhere was constructed and a treehouse that has generated no revenue for the city was constructed at the taxpayer's expense. A five hour a day swimming fee was implemented while the neighborhood free pools have been closed and allowed to deteriorate. The Scranton Parking Authority was dissolved and Robert, Robert Scopoletti lost his job, although Mike Washell landed a $100 an hour job 
controlling the parking garages of Scranton, which, by the way, are in need of millions of dollars of repair and provide shelter for the many homeless and unemployed residents of Scranton. Also, Scranton taxpayers continue to re repay the debt created by Mr. Scopoletti and the previous parking authority. The reason why the 2013 audit has not been completed is that the private firms hired to manage the parking authority have not provided Rossi and Rossi with the audit information. Some things never change. Speaking of, of unemployment, Scranton has remained at the top of the state unemployment list for approximately 41 consecutive months. Poverty rate Scranton, 33% and rising. Scranton constructed a $350,000 chain link fence at Connells Park and called it a dog park. Most cities constructed a dog park at a cost of $90,000 and have a dog park. The city firefighters and police officers won a landmark lawsuit and were awarded millions of dollars by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Why? Because Scranton elected and appointed officials decided that it would be in the best interest of the residents to fight the unions in court. Oh well, you can't win them all, although it would be nice to win one once in a while. For a period of time, fire stations were closed, jeopardizing the safety of the residents and community who work in the city. Police officers removed from the neighborhoods. Scranton city government taxpayers have lost several court cases, which have cost the taxpayers. The police and fire arbitration, the female police officer's harassment case, the commuter tax, minimum wage, and the minimum wage case, just to name a few. Scranton Pension Fund is underfunded, received a severely distressed rating amounting to $113.6 million deficit. That's right, $113.6 million deficit. Scranton Retiree's health care system is underfunded and will eventually collapse. Speaking of collapsing, the bridges throughout the city are actually collapsing, causing major safety and congestion problems for the residents, taxpayers of Scranton. And by all means, we cannot and should not forget the streets. Did I mention that the city forgot to collect $7.8 million in garbage fees while they were attempting to collect tax money from the commuters and nonprofits and giving a $25,000 raise to the mayor who has not been elected yet? How long has the city gone without a cable franchise contract? Four years, maybe? Approximately seven or eight years ago, a t-shirt appeared that read, Legion of Doom. The Legion of Doom predicted the outcome only to be ignored. Just take a look around the city of Scranton. Tomorrow will, will be day 7,938 of being a distressed city. Doomsday is coming closer every day for Scranton taxpayers. Will the embarrassment ever end for Scranton residents? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Les Spindler. Good evening, Council. Les Spindler, city resident, homeowner, taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, recently on a drive through Green Ridge, I noticed there are many, many political signs past the sidewalks out by the curbs. I could be wrong, but I think there's an ordinance stating that that's illegal. It obstructs views of cars. And if memory serves me correct, during Chris Doherty's unsuccessful Senate run, he had many of his opponent's signs that were in that same position taken down by DPW. So uh, I hope something is done with the signs that are there now in Green Ridge. Uh, moving on. I've been thinking about this for quite a while now. This was brought up, God, I don't know how long ago at City Council, but the, the businesses that are in the buildings in the University of Scranton, such as Chick-fil-A, and I thought Council was going to look in to see if they could be taxed. Was there any news on that? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, Council's, within Council's authority to pursue that. In other words, we turned to, for example, in the beginning, we turned to the county and the school district. We met with them, council, school district, county commissioners. And they didn't appear to have any interest in uh, pursuing any of this. 
And so we turned then to the Lackawanna County Tax Assessor's Office, whose job it is to uh, provide all of the information regarding the nonprofits to the city of Scranton. Okay. And they did not cooperate because apparently, you know, the, the county commissioners don't want to take those steps. Well, that's, that's a darn shame. Yes, it is. Lord knows we could use any kind of help we can get. Uh, okay, just lastly, I don't think it's too early to remind everybody that uh, four weeks from Tuesday is the election. And in my opinion, I think this is the most important election that Scranton has ever had. Because if we don't elect the right mayor this year, then I think they could just throw a net over the city and close it up because I think we'll be done. And uh, I don't think a man that can't even take care of his own house should be the person elected. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Miller. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Um, Good, evening. Good evening. Good evening. Just like to begin this evening, uh, with just something that I'm a little uh, disappointed uh, about uh, in regards to uh, the traffic situ situation uh, on Jefferson and Linden. Um, just a little disappointed in, in the, uh, the way the university went about uh, planning uh, the traffic uh, situation down there in terms of uh, closing blocks and, and causing uh, massive delays for those who are trying to make daily commutes each morning uh, from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And um, I know it's caused a lot of uh, a lot of inconvenience for people, and uh, I, I understand uh, that they're they're interested in getting that building torn down. As you can see, they have a lot of it down uh, at this point. But I think that better planning should have went into this, uh, considering that we, we have a lot of uh, you know traffic jams to begin with. Uh, this is just something else, uh, another inconvenience, uh, you know, added to that. And uh, I'm just a little disappointed with the way they handled that. And uh, you know, we do know they they do get away with an awful lot. But I I don't believe in this case they should dictate our traffic flow and I certainly hope that our, our, our police force isn't over there directing traffic I don't believe that uh, we should be involved I believe they should handle that issue themselves and they have a police force and, and let them direct their traffic uh, I don't believe the city should be assisting in that and I'm, I'm not saying we are I'm not exactly sure if we are but if there are plans to do that I don't believe that should uh, that should happen uh, I do think that's inappropriate um, but again I, I, I just wish they would would have thought about uh, the inconvenience that they've uh, piled on a lot of people each morning uh, when they went ahead to put this uh, traffic procedure together. Moving on, uh, you know, I normally wouldn't have gotten into this, but the last two weeks, uh, the suggestion that I proposed to council uh, three weeks ago uh, has come under, uh, I don't want to say criticism, but there's been some concern uh, in regards to uh, the meaning of what I proposed. And, and there seems to be a, a misunderstanding out there, this assumption that it's, it's in some way meant to punish uh, college students. And you know, I, I, I kind of uh, take somewhat of an issue with that because that's, that's not the intended purpose of this, uh, this particular suggestion that I made to council uh, three weeks ago. You know, I, I took personal time to sit down, uh, going back through the August recess, uh, I, I began sitting down and, and trying to put together some different ideas and, and try to come up and brainstorm uh, some different uh, revenue enhancements for the city. Uh, I took a look at some other municipalities, uh, not just in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but across the nation. And when I did find this tuition tax uh, legislation that was uh, proposed in Pittsburgh by the mayor, uh, I didn't come across it and, 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 and say to myself, oh, you know, here's a way to punish the college kids. You know, that, that wasn't my, my purpose. My purpose is to, to come forward and having the understanding that the city uh, needs money, uh, that's what this is about. It's, it's not about harming students. We've talked an awful lot for years about paying your fair share, whether you're someone that lives in the city or someone that, that does business in the city, you pay your fair share. Whether you're a nonprofit, we know where that's taken us through the years. But that's what this is about. It's about services that the city provides daily to not only to the individuals that live here and pay their taxes for those services, but also to those that utilize the institutions that may not live here, such as those students that come from Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, New York, New Jersey, wherever they come from. We're not, we're not tacking on a one, or we wouldn't tack on a 1% to say, you know, we want to punish you for coming in our city. No, we're, we're, 
asking you to, to pay 1% for police protection, fire protection, and the roads that you use each day. And I, I think we could say that in those three, those three areas, uh, we know that those three things are utilized daily, on a daily basis. You can't argue that they're not. I, I really don't believe that an extra, and I, and I don't mean this in an insulting manner, but I really don't believe that an extra two or three hundred dollars is going to make or break on whether or not a parent decides to send their child to an institution within the city. I really don't, I don't buy that at all. Um, there are obviously a lot of different things that, that parents uh, review with their children when determining where they want to send their child. And I think that if they know they're sending their child in a city that's willing to provide services, I, I don't think it's an issue to ask them to contribute a small amount. We have, we have residents of this city who pay thousands and thousands of dollars each year, barely can afford to pay that for the services. And I only think it's fair to ask the college students to contribute. You know, I took the time to do some homework, and the research I prepared shows that we could bring in about $6.5 million annually. And it could probably be more, because the institutions that I put together were primarily uh, the University of Scranton, Marywood, Lackawanna College, Johnson College, the Commonwealth Medical School. But I was also made aware that other institutions of higher learning can also be subject to this tax. So the city has the ability to bring in the excess of millions and millions of dollars each year. So what I would say to those out there is I challenge anyone to come forward. You know, I did my homework. And as I've been saying repeatedly from this podium, uh, I, I respect the opinion and, and the suggestions of a lot of people, but I've, as I've also said, especially last summer when we were dealing with the recovery plan and the budget, when, when we want to be in opposition of something, I firmly believe that that's when it's, it's time to stand up and offer something better. And we understand the challenges we face. You know, Mr. Jackowitz summarized many of them. He, he basically summed up everything. You know, Mr. Elman summarized a lot of different things. We know what we face. We know that we need money and we need it now. And no bad idea, or no idea at this point is bad. You know, the bottom line is real, you know, it's real simple. You can't put it any simpler if you wanted to. The city needs money. Thank and it's going to take creativity, ideas, and a vision to do it. And I challenge anyone to come forward. And everybody needs to get involved because a cooperative effort is what's going to turn this city around. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. That concludes I, our speakers list. Oh, yes. I was going to say, just a point of information. Um, the the traffic, um, the closing of traffic on the 600 block of Linden Street was done um, upon a request from the demolition contractor to the Scranton Police Department and approved by the Scranton Police Department. And in addition, uh, I'm not sure, but um, I just mentioned here, I believe that any policeman that would be used for traffic duty, um, traffic control, would need to be paid um, by the contractor. Um, Mrs. Evans, I, I do believe Councilman McGough is correct. I asked the Chief uh, Graziano that question per our solicitor's request, and he assured me that uh, they are paying, the university is paying for any officers that are hired there. Thank you, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Gray. Thank you. And thank you, Councilman McGough. Is there anyone else who cares to address Council? Andy Spray says Grant and Fells Grantonians. Good evening. To Good evening. people who don't know, the House has passed the bill to change the way the school systems are funded. I spoke on this before and I'll speak on it again. If you're a renter and you rent and pay it to a landlord, contact your state senator and vote no because you're going to be hit the hardest because you get nothing, not a darn thing will you get when this bill is passed, except higher taxes. That's what you're going to get. Now, who are the winners in this situation? Businesses are winners. Distressed cities like Stratton are winners because they're going to gobble up anything you get. And that's what's going to happen. Now, you might get some benefit for about three years or so, but then it's going to be all gone. You're going to be, end up paying more in taxes than you did to the school systems. This is what's going to happen, and history points to that. You don't need a great fort, uh, suit there to tell you. This is how history works. 
They're not doing this for you. If they were, I would say, okay, but they're not. The whole system is the school system and how it's set up. Unless you can correct the school system entirely within the state, all you're doing is throwing good money after bad, and I told you this before. When the guy said he spent 10 years working on this plan, and all he was doing was taking the poor runners and hammering them, that's beyond me. Like a, take a person that lives in the high rise. They're a runner. Now when they go out to buy a pair of shoes, they're gonna pay the tax, because they plan to raise the tax on a lot of different things. And what you buy and what you eat is going to be taxed heavily. And it's an idiotic system. It's, it's, they didn't look at it entirely except for a few special interests. And I had to fight here on the board with the guy who come up with that. Now let's go back to our problem here. Let's look at that 21 million. What's to stop the city from letting the unions, the two unions that are involved in this, acquire the $21 million in property? And then we lease it back off the unions. You can pay them a little, stipula a little more in interest so they make it back, because I know the money was denied them for 10 years. But you can't let 200 and some people destroy the city financially. It just doesn't make sense. Now, we want to see them to get paid. There's no question about that. They deserve it. But there's no reason why we can't pay them over 10 years, say, instead of in one year. And let them have the property. What difference would it make if you're going to lease it back anyway? We did this many, many times before. This is the only time where it really made sense. Because it took that $20 million off our heads in the interest at 100000 a month. It's crazy not to come up with some type of a plan with the union. And they're going to suffer under it anyway. I mean, whatever happens to us happens to them. So maybe this would be a situation where we would both benefit. This would be a win-win situation that we're here many times from council. A win-win situation. But usually that win-win was only for a certain few. But you should look into something like that and maybe make it easier to borrow this other money we're going to need. If you can take that $21 million from our head, it might be easier to borrow some of the other money that we need. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dave Dobson, resident of Scranton. I have to Good say evening. I agree with Good that evening. idea fully. Uh, it would be helpful if the unions could cooperate and possibly consider a bond issue instead of having all this pressure. I have something quick, I'll, I'll just. Thank you. What I have there, and I don't have the editorial, I misplaced that temporarily, but it's uh, Act 47 would just ban municipalities and uh, a lot of these are template laws by the American Legislative Exchange Council and they're usually not in the public interest uh, they uh, in in uh, Michigan they can't maybe buy uh, a sell off Nayog Park but they sold uh, beachfront property in Benton Harbor, Michigan, that was owned by the city and turned it into a golf course for the elite. And uh, those people were just out. And they're looking over the uh, artifacts in the Detroit Museum. They sold the uh, Pontiac Dome, Silver Dome, in Pontiac, Michigan for uh, about 1% of what it was worth and it was left to dilapidate and get damaged from storms and stuff, so who knows what will ever happen to that. But uh, also, I'd like to uh, thank the county, and it's time they wise up and cooperate. I'm a little tired of hearing their ideas that we should pay all the bills. 
uh, and just shut our faces. And uh, with what Andy had to say, be careful what you wish for because, I mean, currently we have uh, new laws and regulations in Pennsylvania that's going to allow PA income tax be deducted and go to favored employers. And uh, I, I mean, they're, they're shoveling it in the front door and handing it out the back. It, it's just it's unbelievable. It's really ridiculous and, and it has to stop. But I don't think that by, uh, we need to, to get control of the school districts and I'm to a point where I think they should be stripped of spending power. They should be just stripped of it. No more new uh, this and that, where we're building a four or six million dollar tennis court now, I read in the paper. School district, they're going to tear down a school and turn it into a, a tennis court. And it's like, why? Uh, you know, we spend more, uh, Mid Valley uh, spent six million dollars on their football field and their books were falling apart. I mean, come on. Uh, once again, uh, I have one year here uh, as a candidate. If the tax office could assist in indigent elderly to get reverse mortgages to at least pay their taxes instead of having them go to uh, an upset sale. And this Act 47 would appoint a benevolent dictator, by the way. And in Michigan also, uh, some of them were, are on their way to prison for embezzlement. So not only did they come in and they pushed everybody out, the mayor, they pushed the council out, they pushed everybody out, no matter who voted for them, then they turned around and embezzled and mismanaged the assets of the city. Even worse, putting them in worse shape than ever. So we don't need no benevolent dictator, as far as I'm concerned, there isn't any. And uh, okay, well, kudos for, uh, the U of S uh, paying for police. And uh, once again, uh, contact your national congressman and tell them to take their trade pact and stuff it because that's just what we need is more U.S. jobless. The only thing these trade pacts, they're, they're negotiating a trans-Pacific trade pact and I haven't bothered to call, try to call Washington because there's probably a hoople over this uh, a shutdown and everything. But uh, it's a, uh, manufacturers moving to certain countries and they're the people that are competing with the Chinese and uh, we, don't need, uh, we don't need any more joblessness in this country. It's just uh, ridiculous. And all they ever do is cite uh, the amount of jobs it's going to create. They don't cite the amount of jobs it destroys. By the way, uh, the golden parrot was chirping about North Korea about a year and a half ago. Well, Kim Il-un closed their industrial park. Billions of dollars invested in their industrial park in North Korea and he closed it. And once again, USIS, I'll give them the golden parrot. They privatized background checks with the federal government Mr. Alexi uh, bought himself a shotgun, even though he was hearing voices and uh, killed 12 people last week and wounded several more. And uh, Mr. Snowden did me a big favor because uh, now I can tell people there's a real reason why I don't want their paranoid emails. Thank you and Thank have you. a good night. And don't forget Thank the block block. <laughs> Good evening, Council. Maurice Schumacher, Good city evening. resident and taxpayer and friend. Good evening. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons I'm here, because I won't be around that much longer, but he will, and I don't want him paying for things that I've enjoyed for uh, all of his life, or at least half of it. Um, I have two, two important issues to me tonight. Um, the first is parking. I've noted the new meters have no days of operation. It says 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And I defy anybody to find a Monday, uh, Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, Monday through Sunday. Uh, 
I have a personal interest in that because the church I go to is located here and I think that would be a, a harm. I think the cathedral would probably be affected by that as well. Um, and I don't know what the hours are. There's nobody to call if you, I mean, do they have an office, these people mm -hmm. who are managing? Yes, I believe it's on Penn Avenue. It's Republic Parking System. Okay. Um, I would like an official answer on why there are no days of operation. Uh, if it's because it's seven days a week, I am highly, I highly object. If it's just a, uh, an easy way to get two extra days worth of funding by people who aren't sure and don't want to risk a ticket, I think that's, that's low and uh, should be beneath us. I, I don't think that's the case, Ms. Schumacher, but we will contact um, the general manager of Republic and ask about your concerns for <clears throat> the days of operation. Okay, thank you. Yes, and uh, mm -hmm. maybe another thing we could look into doing, you know, if they're willing to do this at a very low cost or, or, or no cost at all is uh, sticker or, or put some sort of adhesive uh, to the parking meter that lists the hours of operation. Well, that's what operation. they've done with the hours, that's, but there are no days. That's the, day. that's the whole issue, it's yes. Monday through Friday. So um, that's, that's one thing with them. The other thing, uh, the woman who wrote the, uh, quest the uh, letter to the editor about the ticket she received while attending the, uh, the La Festa, uh, it's, it said she paid a $25 fine. I'm pretty sure that file of Council 100, which is of 2009, which we're still adhering to, said the fine was $20. So I'd like to know when that $5 changed too. I have some other issues on parking, but I'll hold them to next week because I also have a concern about our, our funding um, for uh, that $21 million, or actually probably more at this point. Um, and before I forget, on 5B tonight, in the past, we have always had the property identification number in the, uh, in the agenda. That is not the case in the agenda tonight. I'm wondering if anybody has the uh, PIN number that they could share. Um, and while that's being looked up, I know, uh, well, another, another side, just because it, it has an impact. Mr. Loscom, are you going to give us the breakdown tonight and the numbers of the police and firemen that are we're still working on that I don't have it complete yet who's who is it that's still working I mean it's been over a year now has it not well myself too oh. I, I was working this week so oh okay I didn't have I got, as much okay. time as, as okay well hopefully to. and I do have a packet for you too on, on the uh, crime reports you would oh. ask for too oh good thank you I do uh, yeah do you want me and, to give you this would... map information later or Either, although if somebody has it now, I'll take it now, just in case I have to leave a little early. Are you ready? Uh-huh. 15745 uh -huh. dash 030 dash 004. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now back to, last week there was a, a, a discussion, uh, or maybe it was an, an ex, um, actually just an explanation by Attorney Hughes on where we are on the, on the funding. Um, I think we were led to believe that this was being worked on for the entire year. Uh, and I know the, the, the $500,000 that we would owe in interest for the, at the end of the year, it sounds like a lot, and it is a lot of money, mm -hmm. but it is probably not a lot when you compare it to the fee on a 20 plus million dollar loan. And so I have a real concern with the fee. Uh, do we know what, what the uh, case come and with uh, what Janie Montgomery Scott has in mind for a fee? Um, I'm going to actually address that, that borrowing during motions. And one thing I, I will say is I, I will um, ask uh, and find out what type of fees there will be involved with such as a borrowing a, yeah, As a taxpayer, I would certainly like to know that fee before there's any executed document. Um, 
And I know last year also, because I think maybe there, you could get into a conflict of interest here too, I believe you voted last year to give both the city and council solicitors a percent of the fee or a, a flat dollar amount. Is that, is that not true? Is that in, any, in the case of any additional borrowing or was it only through one particular company? Uh, Solicitor Hughes, would you like to respond? There is, <coughs> excuse me. There is nothing where either Attorney Kelly or myself would get any percentage. It's not based on a percentage. Is it a flat fee, a flat amount? No, it's not a. Nobody oh. knows what the work is. It's on a. It it'd be on a on a on a basis of billing services for services rendered. And that would be with either Janie Montgomery or Case Con. Case Con, right. Oh, okay, it doesn't matter who gets the bone or gets the money. Okay, thank you. But I, I would like to know, um, as I say, in advance. And then also, we're two months past the when we were told we would have the, the audit. Will you be addressing when we expect to see the audit? Um, the, the last I've heard from uh, Ms. McAndrew is sometime later in October. Uh, I, I know that the big hold up with it was the uh, audited financial statements from the parking authority. Okay, and uh, Mr. Rogan, have you, I finished the question, yeah. okay. Uh, have you followed up with the redevelopment authority since that's your uh, area of responsibility and why they are seeking grant for, the, for a, a school that's located in Dunmore rather than seeking out um, I don't remember that request, but I could certainly look into it for you. I think you should do it for the city, but yes, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I think that, uh, yeah, my name's Lee Morgan. Um, I. The first thing I'd like to say is that, you know, all the people who come to these council meetings and, and the members of council, I have a lot of respect for them, but sometimes my opinions are different. And on any fee, on any student, I still disagree. And I, I think to illustrate that today, you should see that there, the Boy Scouts are here, and Marie's got, I guess, her grandson with, them, with her today. And I just would like to ask, you know, why would we want to put a fee on these individuals as they try to become better citizens and, and increase their ability to earn an income? And the other thing that I think we need to take a look at is I think that we need to look at the nonprofits, and it would be a wonderful thing to take a look at their investment portfolios to see how much money they actually have invested in this country, other countries, how much income they really have at their disposal before we determine that we're going to go to students who in many instances their parents either borrow money to send them to school or they borrow money to go to school or the state or federal government gives them some type of grant. And I think that they are the one group of people less capable of politically defending themselves because most of them are not organized politically and they're the easiest target to come after. And I just think that when a city, a state government, or a federal government reaches the point, like Jefferson made some points about what would happen to people as they were disenfranchised from their government. And this just seems to really be heading that way. And these, these people, most of them weren't even born when this city went into distress status. And if, if the Commonwealth couldn't figure a course of action that would bring the city back, and the PEL I mean, why would we go after students? I mean, isn't it the greatest gift in the world to have a college education and be able to better yourself and, and increase upward mobility? So why would we try to stifle that and try to tax their success? And the other thing I have here today is that I'd like the women, League of Women Voters, when it does its mayoral debates, to give the candidates questions in advance and ask them what their plan is to turn this city around. And ask them how they're going to do it. Because, you know, 
I mean, everybody here is aware. I put my name on the ballot, and I did go to the to debates. I didn't campaign, but I did put my name on the ballot, and I brought up some issues. And all the candidates are talking about not raising taxes. Um, they, aren't, they, have, they just have a ba basically a, a revenue-neutral stance. And I just think that it's time to let the people who want to lead this city come forward. One of them is going to get elected, unless, an unless somebody does a write-in. But let's have some truth in the person we put in the mayor's office next time. And let's hear their plan. Let's not just say, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, because the reality is that even when you listen to the PEL talk about 117 or however many percent tax increase they're talking about, we're still not in front of the train. We're still chasing it. The city's financial situation is beyond dire. And how the Commonwealth didn't come here and try to help us at this point, really, I can't understand it. And, you know, it's not a personal attack on this council, but to be really bluntly honest with you, this thing is just so huge that, in my own opinion, I don't think there's anything this council can do. I don't think there's anything this mayor can do. I mean, if we were credit worthy, people would be loaning us money. They'd be standing outside waiting to hand us some, and they're not. And that tells you that we're bankrupt, and it's time for somebody to come forward. And I don't think the state wants to come forward because they don't want to acknowledge that Act 47 didn't work, and we took on some of their fights that they should have fought on their own. Okay, and, and the, the residents of this city, you know, they talked about people in the city who make over $1,000. I know a lot of people that make over $1,000 a week in this city. But, you know, I also know a lot of people that make over $1,000 a week that have moved out of this city because they're tired of paying $50 and $55 and $60 a week in, in wage tax. And the truth of the matter is that we've got to come to the conclusion that we need these candidates that are going to be mayor to come forward and tell us the truth. And then we need to take that truth and listen to it and determine we're going to do something about it instead of blaming the Scranton Times, blaming individual council members, blaming the present mayor, blaming people in the past. Because until you can control your past, you can't control your future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? 5A, motions. Councilman McGough, do you have any comments or motions? Uh, not right now. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Rogan, do you have any comments or motions? Today? Yes, just two citizens' requests tonight. Um, one is a property located at 1080 Cottage Avenue. Um, this has been a problem property before that has been reported to licensing and inspections. Um, Mrs. Craig, can we please send a letter to Mr. Seitzinger and um, some of the inspectors as well? Um, because Mr. Seitzinger hasn't been replying to council. Um, regarding the property at 1080 Cottage, um, this property is, I believe, a duplex, and there are residents report that there are large amounts of people living in there. Um, pigeons are doing what they do in the attic, and um, there's a lot of problems both inside and out. Um, next, um, there's, some, there's numerous potholes on Division Street. Um, from Kaiser Avenue up to the Turnpike Bridge, as well as the intersection of Frank Street and Crisp Avenue. These are all on East Mountain. The resident reports to me that they were called, that they called the DPW numerous times and spoke to Mr. Vitrus, um, the head of the union, and Mr. Vitrus said he was waiting for approval from Mr. Dewar, the head of the department. So if Mr. Dewar um, could be made aware of those as well, and hopefully they could be repaired because this is on a, a bus route. Um, where the buses travel for the kids. And that is all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Loscombe, have you any comments or motions? I really have nothing this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Joyce, do you have comments or motions? Wow, everyone's short on comments tonight. Yes, uh, I do have some uh, comments. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to announce today that I received a phone call on my way home from work. It was uh, about around five o'clock today uh, from Mike Judge, our uh, financial advisor. And he had informed me that the mayor and all appropriate parties have signed off on his contract and now he's able to work uh, for the city. And I think that's very important because in initial conversation and also from Attorney Hughes's comments last week, we learned that um, 
uh, Mr. Judge has some interested parties in pursuing uh, the um, borrowing to cover the police and fire award, as well as um, the increase this year to the MMO. And he's also looking into the possibility of refinancing some debt for 2014, which could um, assist us in keeping uh, any tax increase to um, the lowest possible amount that it could be at. And really, uh, that's my goal. As, as you know, I don't have much more time on council. This is the last budget. I will be uh, working on uh, while on council. And it's my goal to keep the tax increase as low as it possibly could. I think it's inevitable at this point to say that there will be no tax increase at all. Any candidate that's running for office, any um, elected official that says there, w there will be no tax increase is telling you a flat out lie. We realize the situation that the city is in, and we realize that um, we're revenue strapped. We're, we're, we, our expenses are exceeding what we're bringing in, and that's very problematic. And really, I think what needs to happen in the future is the state has to have some involvement in altering and changing the Local Tax Enabling Act um, to help cities um, decide what they could levy taxes on. And, uh, and I know that there was an editorial in the Scranton Times about this. The way that the current tax system is set up, uh, municipalities are too reliant on property taxes to survive. And this is a large problem that faces Pennsylvania municipalities. Not, not even, and not only those that are um, in distressed status, but just municipalities in general. We have paid police departments, paid fire departments that we need, that we vitally need to uh, prevent fire, or to um, put out fires in our city and protect our streets. But this is something that a lot of boroughs don't have, and they don't have the same expenses that municipalities do have. So I think in the future, uh, you know, I'm hoping to see a change in the Local Tax Enabling Act that gives uh, municipalities uh, more leeway as far as what they could tax so the burden isn't always placed on the homeowner. Unfortunately, you know, you hear too many times um, the suggestions coming out of uh, the Pennsylvania Economy League uh, is, is to raise taxes on property owners. And really, with an antiquated system in place that's currently in place for Pennsylvania, there's not too many other options as far as what you could, or what you could do to generate more revenue as far as taxation is concerned. And at this point, you know, you look at other things. You, s you could say, oh, well, if you don't increase property taxes, what would you do? You can't increase the wage tax because that's already ridiculously oppressive in this city. And we have some of the highest permit fees, uh, license and permit fees in the state of Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, you could go through the list of taxes. Even the real estate transfer tax is something that puts... Um, Put you at a dis or puts you at a disadvantage if you're trying to sell a property or if you're coming into the city to buy a property. So, you know, I'll just close my thought with saying that I hope to see in the future um, the state take action and uh, really look into uh, some serious tax reform for municipalities. On, other, on another note, uh, we did receive an update from our tax collector, Bill Courtright, as far as the um, city funds distributed in comparison to two th this time in 2012 from the single tax office. And to begin, I'll address uh, real estate taxes this year, and, I'll, and I won't read off the exact numbers this time. I'll just, I'll just round them off because I know I probably uh, maybe bore, a little, bore some people by reading long-winded numbers. But uh, 
real estate taxes, we're close to 14700000 uh, Last year at this time, we were close to uh, 11900000 So we see an increase of uh, uh, roughly $2.8 million. Uh, that's 23.9%. However, you do have to remember that there was a tax increase of 22%, so we would expect to see those figures to rise. Uh, delinquent real estate tax, uh, so far this uh, year, the single tax office has collected and distributed um, 535,000 and change. Uh, to the city of Scranton. Last year during the same time period, uh, that number was at $476,000. So that's a 12.5% increase. Uh, the LST, um, the tax office has collected and distributed a little bit over $1.2 million. And last year during the same time period, the tax office collected and distributed um, $1.14 million. That's an increase of about $80,000 or 7%. And the business privilege and mercantile taxes, the um, tax office has collected and distributed to the city $2.1 million. Uh, last year at the same time, the, the tax office had collected and distributed roughly $1.5 million. So that's an increase of 350 some thousand dollars or 20.2%. So uh, we see that um, the tax office uh, is uh, doing their due diligence in uh, collections and distribution to the city. Uh, and on a final note, I will announce that the um, uh, state did, uh, did remit to the city a check for three mil uh, slightly over $3 million, $3,6493.55. Million, uh, um, for uh, their portion of uh, general munis municipal pension system state aid. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. I'd like to begin by addressing the $600,000 payment from BRT Ice Incorporated, LLC, which is owed to the city of Scranton. After having been a KOZ tax-free property, apparently for seven years from 2004 through 2010, BRT Ice is scheduled for a tax assessment hearing on October 24, 2013. In addition, a loan of $250,000 made to BRT ICE in 2004 by the Scranton Redevelopment Authority was paid in full in February 2013, thereby removing a lien on the property. Apparently, BRT ICE was able to pay its loan but continues to ignore what is owed to the city of Scranton. Mrs. Craig, please send a letter to the mayor and the city solicitor on behalf of city council requesting an update on this payment, which is included as revenue in the 2013 operating budget. The city of Scranton cannot afford to overlook the outstanding debt of BRT ICE. It is essential 2013 revenue, and it must be aggressively pursued. Uh, next, on September 27, 2013, letters were sent to Mr. Eugene Barrett, Mr. John Poshis, Mr. Bill Kelly, and Ms. Katie Leonard from Scranton City Council concerning the flooding problems affecting Augusta Avenue, Lemon Street, Gaston Place, and North Main Avenue. On October 1st, City Council received a petition signed by residents of these streets who are experiencing flooding, road erosion, displacement of sediment, and undermining of a foundation due to water runoff and inadequate drainage. These residents request a review by the city engineer and the Scranton Sewer Authority, as well as a meeting among representatives of Johnson College, the Scranton Sewer Authority, Mr. Poshis, and themselves. Mrs. Craik, please send a copy of this petition to Mr. Barrett, Mr. Poshis, Mr. Kelly, and Ms. Leonard with a request for notification of the dates scheduled for property and street review and the meeting with residents. 
It is imperative that these actions occur before the onset of winter <coughs> weather conditions that will cause significant icing and increased deterioration of roads. And finally, I wish to present a brief update provided by Republic Parking System. All new IPS meters were certified, installed, and operational as of Wednesday evening, October 2nd, 2013. The city should be pleased with the purchase of new meters. No downtime and no loss of revenue occurred while swapping out the old meter heads. Further, on Tuesday, September 24th, there were five credit card transactions. On Wednesday, September 25th, 61 transactions. And on Thursday, September 26th, 139 transactions. The meters are very user friendly and their monitoring is highly effective. If a meter is out of service for any reason, credit card error, coin jam, etc., the general manager of Republic Parking immediately receives a text and email notifying him that the particular meter is out of service. And if we consider multiple meters being out of service over a year's time due to just simple coin jams, we can see the substantial savings provided by this new technology. And finally, uh, just one addition, uh, Ms. Schumacher. I kept thinking about uh, your questions as the meeting progressed, and I believe that Republic Parking would be following the old ordinance that would determine days and hours of parking. We've discussed this before, I think, at, at the podium. That ordinance was never amended, nor was it repealed. So I believe that the same applies. They are simply, uh, I think, applying what the, the current and original ordinance states. Now, um, I do agree with you that it, it can be confusing for people, especially those who are not from Scranton, uh, what days must parking meters be fed. And so I think we can ask if there is some way to possibly remedy that situation for everyone. And that's it. 5B sale of tax delinquent property at the corner of Linden Street and Taylor Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, to Lyndon Taylor, LLC, 56 Ledge Drive, Lakeville, Pennsylvania, 18438, for the sum of $2,500. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Sixth order, no business at this time. Seventh order, 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Finance, file of council number 48, 2013, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to apply for and execute a grant application, and if successful, a grant agreement and accept the funds related thereto through the BJAFY 13 Edward Byrne Justice Assistance Grant, JAG program, local solicitation in the amount of $23,391. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Finance? As Chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of item 7A. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscombe? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. If there is no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned.